Hello, welcome back. In this video, we'll be covering chapter two, trade-offs, comparative advantage, and the market system. We'll be introducing the first economic model this semester, the production possibilities frontier. But before we get into that, I do want to remind you of what the economic problem every society must face is. The answer to that is scarcity. Scarcity is when unlimited wants exceed limited resources. Therefore, we face trade-offs. And what the PPF curve shows us is a graphical representation of these trade-offs. So let's go ahead and get started. The PPF curve is a curve showing the maximum obtainable combination of two goods that can be produced with available resources and current technology. Okay, so in the PowerPoint, they use the example of two different types of Tesla models. However, I like to use a more historical example with guns and butter. This is historically used to illustrate the production possibility frontier guns refers to security goods both related to the military including the soldiers themselves and the equipment weapon ships tanks while butter represents non-security goods, social welfare, schools, hospitals, parks, and roads. So we have two kinds of goods. And the term has actually been used quite a bit throughout history. Um, not only was it used during World War II, but it was also used by Lyndon B. Johnson, Margaret Thatcher. It's also referenced in... some rap songs and so I just like to use this example as it's more historically used. So in our guns and butter example we have here a chart that shows uh, several points that represent the quantity of guns and butter we can produce respectively. I want to think about these in terms of thousands. So we have 8,000 guns, therefore we can only produce, we actually can't produce any butter, but if we produce 6,000 guns, we can produce 2,000 pounds of butter. 4,000 guns can we can also produce 4,000 pounds of butter and respectively. So we see if we graph out these points here with butter on the y-axis and guns on the x-axis, we have these points labeled. So if we produce 6,000 guns, we can produce 2,000 pounds of butter. So over 6 up 2, we have point F. Four and four, you have point E. Two and six, you have point D. And then zero and eight, you have point C. Okay, so we can see that C through G are graphed on the graph and also associate with coordinates given by our chart. So we see here we have what's called a linear PPF curve. It's linear because the slope is constant, which means that it has a constant opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is a new vocabulary term here. It is the highest value alternative given up. And so we can actually calculate the opportunity cost of producing however many more guns, how much butter we have to give up, or vice versa, respectively. So in the example here, if we're going to move from point C to point D here, 
what do we have to do? If we want to gain 2,000 guns, we have to give up 2,000 pounds of butter in production. So we move from 8,000 to 6,000 pounds of butter in order to go from zero to 2,000 guns. And you can do that along the entire curve and we see since we have a linear line a constant slope which means we have a constant opportunity cost. So now that we've established opportunity cost and a linear PPF curve how those two are related let's talk about points that are on the PPF curve and those points that are not on the PPF curve. So in the model, we have points C through G that are located on the PPF curve. And we see points A and B that are off the PPF curve. So thinking about the PPF curve in terms of a frontier, remember this is the boundary. And if we are outside the boundary, that means we're unattainable. So point A is going to be unattainable. But if we're inside the boundary, that means we can attain, attain it. However, we're not being efficient because we could produce more given our current resources and technology. We could move from point B to point E or point D or point C or anywhere along that curve. However, we're not able to attain point A. All right, so now let's talk about what happens if opportunity costs are increasing instead of constant. If they are increasing, this means that some resources may be better to one task than the other. Essentially, that means the more resources already devoted to an activity, the smaller the payoff to devoting additional resources to that activity. So over time, what will happen is that cost will slowly increase as production increases rather than being constant. So at first, the cost may be small, but then over time, as you try to produce more and more, the cost will be increasing. So we see down here, I've noted two graphs, graph one and two. They both show curves with increasing opportunity costs. So it's important to note that Curved PPF curves have increasing opportunity cost, while linear PPF curves have a constant opportunity cost. I've also demonstrated here what it looks like if there's economic growth in the economy. What happens when economic growth occurs is the PPF curve will shift out. There'll be an entire shift of the curve when economic growth occurs. Economic growth is the ability of the economy to increase the production of goods and services. So in graph one, we show a shift of the entire curve. You can see here we're now able to produce more guns and more butter. In graph two, we see a rotation of the PPF curve, which means we're going to see improvement in one industry while the other one does not improve. So here, the example is improvement in the butter industry, such as refrigeration. The introduction of refrigeration enables butter to be preserved longer. You're able to produce more butter. And so you see that the curve has rotated outward on the x-axis. So you're able to produce more butter, but the amount of guns produced stays the same. Okay, so let's move on to the next section. So our next 
section is over comparative advantage and trade. Comparative advantage, we'll go ahead and define it down here a little bit later in the outline, is the ability of a firm, individual, or country to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than competitors. Lower opportunity cost, we just talked about what an opportunity cost is. While absolute advantage is the ability of an individual firm or country to produce more of a good or service than competitors using the same amount of resources. So absolute advantage is just more, while comparative advantage is at a lower opportunity cost. In economics, we care about comparative advantage. We don't care who can produce the most. We care about who can produce at the lower cost. So here I've given an example that shows apple picking and cherry picking. So you have you and your neighbor, you have a limited time to pick apples or cherries, and the table shows the amount of fruit that each of you could pick by devoting all of your time to that task. So you can produce 20 pounds of apples or zero pounds of cherries, or you could produce 20 pounds of cherries or zero pounds of apples. Your neighbor, on the other hand, they can produce 30 pounds of apples, but they can't produce any cherries, or they could produce 60 pounds of cherries and zero pounds of apples. So let's answer these questions. Who has the absolute advantage in picking apples and in cherries? Remember, absolute is the who can produce more. So who is able to produce more apples? Well, if you devote all your time to picking apples, you can only pick 20 pounds. While your neighbor, if they devote all their time, they can produce 30 pounds of apples. So your neighbor is going to have absolute advantage in picking apples. Let's look at cherries. You can produce 20 pounds of cherries and zero pounds of apples, but your neighbor can produce 60 pounds of cherries and z if they were devoting all their time to picking cherries and they would be producing zero apples. So who has the absolute advantage of picking cherries? Your neighbor does again. 60 is greater than 20, 30 is greater than 20 as well. Your neighbor has absolute advantage in both. Okay, but let's hold on for a second. What do we care about in economics? We care about comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the basis of trade. So who has the comparative advantage in picking apples and cherries respectively? Okay, let's look at this. So this one takes a little bit more thought and some calculation. Apples, we need to figure out how many cherries you have to give up in order to pick apples. So we need to get it in terms of cherries when we're looking at who can produce apples at the lower cost. So let's look at you first. You can either produce 20 apples or 20 cherries, right? So if we need to get it in terms of cherries, we need to get this 20 to equal 1. How do we do that? You would divide by 20, divide both sides by 20. So we can see here it's a 1 to 1 ratio. For every one apple you can produce, you could alternatively produce one cherry. Seems straightforward enough. However, you got to do this for your neighbor as well. So let's look at your neighbor. Your neighbor can produce 30 pounds of apples. Let's do this in a different color. Your neighbor can produce 30 pounds of apples or they can produce 60 pounds of cherries. Again, we need to get this in terms of cherries when we're looking at how much it's costing us to produce apples. So how do we get apples to one? Sorry. Sorry. 
apples to 1, we need to divide by 30, divide by 30. And what do we have here? We have one apple to two cherries ratio, two pounds of cherries. So who can produce apples at the lower cost? So it's costing you one cherry and it's costing your neighbor, it's costing you one cherry here, and it's costing your neighbor two cherries, so you can produce apples at the lower cost. It's only costing you one cherry versus two cherries. Okay, so you have the comparative advantage in apples, but let's look at cherries. Again, with cherries, we need to get it in terms of apples. We need to know how many apples it's costing us in order to produce cherries, for you, it's fairly straightforward since it is a one-to-one -one ratio. We can see that for every one cherry, we have to give up one apple. But with your neighbor, the division isn't as easy. It's going to be a fraction. And so if we have 60... Again, I'm not doing this in the right color. If you have... 60 cherries versus 30 apples. We need to get it in terms of apples. Divide by 60, divide by 60. We have one cherry costing us one half of an apple. So who can produce cherries at the lower cost? It's costing you one apple. It's costing your cherry, it's costing your neighbor a half of an apple. So one half is less than one, so your neighbor has the advantage, comparative advantage, in producing cherries. All right. Again, trade. Trade is the act of buying and selling. The basis for trade is comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. That's why we care so much about comparative advantage. When trade occurs, usually one country individual business will have the comparative advantage in the production of a specific good or service, and so they will specialize in that specific good or service, and you'll specialize in what you're relatively good at. I'm not going to test you over gains from trade. I just want you to understand that comparative advantage is the basis for trade. And so whoever has the comparative advantage in production of a certain good is likely to specialize in that and then trade with someone who does not have the comparative advantage. Okay, so here I just graphed out the PPF curves for you and your neighbor at the bottom of this outline or this page of the outline and you can see you have a 20 to 20 constant slope linear PPF curve and your neighbor has a 30 to 60 constant slope linear PPF curve. So you have a one-to-one -one ratio while your neighbor has a one-to-one one half ratio, cherries to apples, respectively. All right, let's move on from comparative advantage. We spent quite a bit of time on that, but I wanted to make sure you understood how the ratios were calculated. So let's go ahead and move on to the market system. So we're on our last section of this chapter. The market system, we've already defined what a market is. I won't read you the definition again, but we have two main groups in the modern economy. We have households and we have firms. Households are the individuals that provide factors of production, while firms are those that supply goods and services to the product markets. Households receive payments for the factors of production by selling them to firms in the factor markets. And households buy products from firms in the product market. So what are these factors of production we're talking about? We're talking about land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. So we have our factors of production here. These are pretty important factors of production and that you need to know. We have land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. 
I put them in this order because it is easy to remember that way. What does land consist of? Land consists of essentially land itself and oil, water, natural resources, all si types of resources related to the earth, gifts of nature, and raw materials. What about labor? Labor consists of all types of work. That ranges from part-time work to full-time work. Um, and so we have different levels involved in the labor force. Then we have capital. Capital refers to physical capital, such as computers, office buildings, machine tools. They're used in production of other goods. We've talked about that briefly. And then finally, we have entrepreneurship. It's someone who operates a business. An entrepreneur is someone who oper operates a business. And entrepreneurship is the actual ability of that entrepreneur to bring together other factors of production to successfully produce and sell goods and services. So entrepreneurship is essentially the ability to bring together the other factors in a successful business. So we want to think about what's received in exchange for these four factors of production. So in exchange for land, um, a household is paid usually rent in exchange. For labor, they're going to be paid a wage. For capital, typically you'll be you'll be paid either a rent or interest. And then entrepreneurs, they receive profit in exchange. So these groups within the market, as well as the factors themselves, are illustrated in what's called a circular flow diagram. It illustrates how the participants in the markets are linked. And so these bullet points kind of explain the circular flow model. So we can see that here we have our circular flow model, households, firms, factor markets, product markets. Households, they provide the factors of production to the firms in the factor markets. The firms then receive the factors of production from the factor markets and turn them into products that are then sold in the product market. And households then buy products from the par product market and pay the firms in exchange. So I'll let you analyze that diagram. And the last couple things I want to talk about are the ideas of a free market. This is one with few government restrictions on how a good or service can be produced or sold, how a factor of production can be employed. Free market concept was argued for by Adam Smith in the inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. This is a quite extensive book that has several different arguments related to and advocating for free markets. And then finally, I did go ahead and define entrepreneur for you down here related to bringing together the factors of production. So that about covers it for chapter two. Therefore, if you have any other further questions, please feel free to let me know.